to know what to say to introduce this writer and her work, because any words I use will become washed out when set up against the real deal. Plus, there are so many different angles to talk about, but I'll give it a shot. You can also read my blog post where I talk about my reading of Lydia's book and how I responded to it. So let's start with the facts. Lydia Yuknovich teaches writing at Mount Hood Community College, or as she describes it, Mostly I show up and beg people to have a dialogue with me about ideas. She says she teaches writing and literature and art as if they were urgent. And for some of us, they are. She is the author of three collections of short fiction and a book of criticism. Her first novel, The Small Backs of Children, is due to be published in 2012. She and her husband also run a small press, and from what I've gathered, it's the love of her husband and son that enabled her to find a place of joy which enabled her to write this treasure of a book. Lydia's memoir, The Chronology of Water, fondly referred to as Cow, is an exploration of memory and experience through the lens of her life as a swimmer, the story of how a swimmer resuscitated herself. Personally, I think the marriage of Lydia's memoir and Hawthorne Books, the book's Portland-based publisher, is a brilliant one. Hawthorne is one of my favorite publishers, and the book is stunning in both content and physicality, which I have to think pleases Lydia. She has said in interviews that she resisted writing a memoir because she didn't believe in the genre. Her creative strategy in writing Cow was based on the use of absence and silence and on staying true to the body, and she has succeeded beyond imagine. The reviews of this book have been stunning. <clears throat> Just read the blurbs in here. <laughs> they are absolutely mind-blowing, and I concur. It's been called raw, real, and honest without a ripple of self-pity. See, I'm not the only one who can't resist those water puns. <laughs> Another reviewer had this to say, I strongly encourage anyone reading this book to buy the book immediately and then keep it beneath your pillow or shove it down your pants or crack open your rib, rib cage and hold the boat, book next to your heart. It really is that beautiful and brilliant. Again, I concur. Please join me in welcoming Lydia Yuknovich. I thought about my dead little baby girlfish. Dead infants don't get urns unless you pay for them, and then they stuff crap in besides just ashes to cover the smallness of a body. My daughter's ashes were in a small pink box, pink for girls, a box the size of a hacky sack ball that fits in the palm of your hand. I took my box to Hesita Head. The coast at Hesita Head in December is epic. Me, my first husband, Philip, my sister, and weirdly, my parents, near strangers. Pretending to be a family, we stumble walk down over the rocks to the water's edge. The sound of the ocean waves is large enough to stop your thinking. My mother closed her eyes and said a prayer in a southern drawl. Philip sang, I see the moon, the lullaby my mother sang to me as a child, which made me feel a little like I might faint. My sister read, Ample Make This Bed by Emily Dickinson, and nearly killed us all with its beauty. Then my father, the architect, pulled something out of his pocket, a folded up piece of paper. On it he'd written a poem. Sort of, it rhymed. When he read it, his voice shook. The only time in my life I heard that. It rained, cold, windy, the definition of Oregon. <laughs> After that, Philip and I took the little pink box, which I'd been clutching in my hand hard enough to nearly crush it, and walked over to where the river joins the ocean. Have you been to Encina Head? That's why I picked that spot. I could see river rocks leading into the sea and sand, and I smelled and tasted salt water. And I don't know if I was crying. My face was wet with ocean and rain, and the lighthouse stood guard, and all the waters of a life met at this tiny nexus. Then I handed him the fragile little box, and he took it in his hand, and I said, throw it as far as you can. So we, I don't know, we were in college. There really isn't another way to say this. He fucking chucked it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the thing is, that little riverway that leads to the sea at Hasita Head, right there, it has a really mean cross current. So while Philip and I stood there watching the little box float nearly out of eyesight, we also stood and watched it come the fuck back, pretty much to our very feet, knocking itself literally 
against his shoe. I look back over my shoulder to where the posse of sadness that was my idiotic family stood. They were far away, almost dots. I looked back at Philip, Philip, and then I said, try kicking it. I don't know why I said that. Why do we say these things? I have no idea. So he, um, he fucking kicked it really hard. This time it didn't go very far at all, and it simply launched soggily into the air and plunked down and circled back to us only slower and kind of fallen apart this time. So without being able to stop, and this is true in deep tragedy, I started laughing. And he started laughing. I mean, really hard. We were laughing our asses off, and I didn't know how to stop, and he didn't know how to stop. But then the little box began to disintegrate. Cheap-ass pink crappy cardboard. As I peeled the dumb paper away, I saw that the ashes were exactly inside a small paper plastic bag, sorry. Almost like a pot baggie. I tried not to laugh, but I couldn't help it, and Phil went, what? And peeked over my shoulder, and then we got the giggles, and we couldn't stop, because we had this little pot baggie of ashes between us, and we were already laughing and crying and laughing. I said, God damn it, I have to stop laughing. It's not funny. It's pretty fucking far from funny. And he agreed, but he couldn't stop either because you just can't. And I had snot all over my face, and I was laughing so hard my stomach, former world, hurt. Then finally I knew what to do. I opened the little faux call full of ash carefully with my teeth, like animals do. Then I walked out into the ocean for real. I had a vintage red wool coat on and brushed leather cowboy boots. Philip tried to follow me in, but I said no. I wave walked until I was up to my abdomen and the water felt ice cold on my stitches and it numbed the hurt there and it was good. And I dumped the nearly weightless contents of my daughter into my right hand. Some of the ash blew into the air, but most of it didn't. It was wet, like sand. And then I let my right hand lower into the water, and I just let go, and I closed my eyes. My father told me later it was the bravest thing he'd ever seen. I never know how to took that from a man who abused us all. <laughs> There's a place on the Oregon coast called Glen Eden Beach. It's between Lincoln City and Newport, both tourist towns. There's a resort there called Salishan. The resort's nestled up against a little saltwater bay and estuary, and beyond that, the ocean. It has a famous golf course, which I have actually played, even though I suck at golf. My father took us there when I was a kid. He called it a family thing. It's the only thing we did together as a family that I can recall that worked. I don't know exactly why it worked, but I'd watch my father sit out on the balcony of the luxury hotel room and look out at the ocean, at the windblown signature tree of that resort, at the birds and the way light changed over the water, and he looked at peace, like you will if you go there, like somebody else's father. At the resort, there's a fine swimming pool and hot tub, and as a family, my mother, father, sister, and I spent hours in the waters. My mother would side-stroke her suddenly weightless swan body up and down the pool, smiling like a girl, and my sister and I would swim the goof-off way kids do, going under and up and splashing and racing and treading water and diving for coins, despite our age difference. My father would wade up into his hips, his chest sometimes up to his chin. Since his feet were still touching the bottom, he felt safe. And though he'd only venture halfway down the pool to avoid the depths of the far end, he looked, I think it's the word, happy. Five years we went back to Salishan until my sister left home. Of course, Salishan's not just a resort. The Salishan languages are a group of languages of the Native Americans of the Pacific Northwest. They're characterized by fusional, inflected language and astonishing consonant clusters. And all Salish languages are either extinct or endangered, but that's not something I knew as a kid. The word embedded itself in my head and heart differently than any other words, and so it had a meaning secret like you get when you're a kid. 
sometimes when I was hurt or angry or scared as a kid, I'd close my eyes and press my palms to my face, and I'd say, Salishan, Salishan, hoping it could work some kind of magic on the terror of family. After we moved back to Oregon, when my son was about five, he's ten now, <laughs> I took him and Andy back to my Salishan. I didn't know what would happen. Perhaps that kind of return would bring me nothing but sadness, and we were driving to the ocean of my childhood. But I trusted the ocean's pull. When we got to within a mile of the resort, when we drove past the estuary and around the corner where the Douglas firs make a mound of forest in the heart of what is Salishan, my heart let loose. It wasn't the resort. It was the word. It was a space of ocean or peace that offered hope differently to a child. I rolled the window down and the salt air bathed my face. My son, who was five, seemed excited, but he didn't know why. When you're five, it's like that. My husband, Andy, said, is this it? Yes, I said, this is the place. My son had never been to a fancy resort place like that, so he spent the first 10 minutes running around the room in a little kid glee dance, and then he found the white terry cloth robes in the closet that are customary for visitors. So he stripped naked immediately, put the white robe on, went out onto the balcony, and turned to us and said, this is the life! <laughs> <laughs> then we all went down to the pool, the pool of my childhood hope. Miles kept saying the word, Salishan. Words carry oceans on their small backs. Joy, a word, an act of imagination. Me, Andy, Miles, in the pool. In the pool, we work on Miles' water skills. My husband swims and floats and laughs and dives down like a kid, making his nose run because he's allergic to chlorine, and he doesn't care because it's fun. When I am in the Salishan pool with Miles, I do something unfamiliar. I play. Usually we play water games Miles has invented, all of which involve him getting to keep his head above the water. This time he tells me he has a very important game, and I say, okay, what is it? I'm going to put my whole head underwater. I nod and stay quiet, trying not to blow it, because if you get too excited as a parent, you screw it up. I move toward him to hold him so we can dunk down together quickly and painlessly. No, no, he says, you stay over there and do it, and I'll do it over here, and we can look at each other and try to hold our breath as long as we can with our heads underwater. Our whole heads. Okay, I say. My heart. He's got his goggles on. He's got his swimmer's weenie gear on. He's got a hold of his nose with one hand, and with the other, he's going to count off. One, two, three. And then he takes the hugest breath in, like, ever, and he puts his head under all the way, and I do too. I can see him through the blue, his beautiful, giant, underwater head, for the first time, holding his own breath, a magic. When we rush up for air, we're both laughing, and I'm telling him how proud I am of him. And he's splashing around, and Annie comes over, and we do a weird little family group hug. You know, like people who are a family, goofing off on vacation. Again, he says. We do, and we do. Big apple heads, under and under, and laughing in this water with the two of them. The boy, the man. I almost can't breathe, because I didn't know. It's a family, and it's mine. It's a small, tender thing. The simplicity of loving, for the first time in my life, I'm learning to live on land. Thanks.